We are back in Millennia MMA in Rancho Cucamonga, California. And this time we're not leaving until we get all the goods. So stay tuned for some great interviews with owner Batiste Mansori, one of his pro fighters, Daryl Montague, and some awesome MMA moves inside this ring with a twist. So stay tuned to see what it's all about. <laughs> Why Millennia? Why did you start it? How did you start it? Um, and what went into that? Well, um, well, that's a, as a kid, I mean, the, the area I grew up in, we were kind of, uh, I was kind of raised in kind of a ghetto area. And all the kids in the neighborhood were basically, there was a boxing gym and a karate gym right by my house. So growing up, I would go to boxing and I would go to take Taekwondo and Karate and martial arts. Um, millennia, I would say growing up, <clears throat> my brother was a wrestler. He, he wrestled for Rubido High School and then wrestled for Mount San Antonio College. So he was always kind of wrestling with me every weekend. He's a stepbrother, so he would come every other weekend and he would wrestle with me and teach me a bunch of moves. And we loved the WWF growing up and Hulk Hogan and so uh, I was always kind of somewhat involved in wrestling, but I was more into like boxing and Taekwondo and karate. I never really, really looked at wrestling as an actual martial art or a form of fighting. In 1994, I had a, another cousin up the street who had a video store from where I lived. He called me up and he told me, I got this video and you got to come over here and watch it. It's amazing. It's top martial artists from around the world really fighting with each other in a tournament. So I get on my bike and I rode up to his video store and, and I was hooked ever since. We watched uh, the first UFC and I saw Hoist Gracie and <laughs> he was a grappler. He was taking everybody down, submitting everybody. So I was instantly hooked on that. So me and my brother and my other cousin, Romeo Rum, who's my partner today, would we basically laid some mats down in the garage and we just started going at it every day. We were hooked. And kudos to you because from just a simple video spawned all of this and yeah. it's absolutely an amazing gym and you guys have produced a lot of amazing fighters. With that said, what is the importance for you as far as um, advocating mixed martial arts, amateur mixed martial artists? Um, I think it's huge. We start them at a young age. Um, the, tomorrow, the sport, the level of the, the fighter is going to be extremely high. I mean, you can see within a few years of the champions of four or five years ago compared to the champions of today, you can't even compare them. The sport is evolving at a high speed. And I think we kind of had a head start on that because we, I started fighting at 18 years old. I was competing and I was involved with a promotion. So we were forced to keep up with the sport where other people I think weren't really competing and weren't really fighting so they had their own ideas of how they had to train. We basically started traveling to train with different wrestlers, different Brazilian Jiu Jitsu stylists, boxing, Muay Thai. So as kids, we before we opened the gym, we were, after the garage thing, I started to train with a lot of different people. I would go train at different boxing gyms. I would go 
to the colleges and the high school to wrestle. I started taking Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes for the submission game. So I think we started to evolve at a really early stage, and I think that's a key to our success today. We were evolving at a, at a really early point because in the fights that we had, I was like, well, I'm trying to take this guy down, but he punched me a few times, so maybe I need to start working on my my boxing and kickboxing. My buddy fights another guy who beats him on the ground, so we need to start working on that. So we kind of evolved with the sport. We evolved with the UFC because we were already competing. And that's very true, and, um, like most sports, but I think uh, mixed martial arts is a extremely, it's constantly evolving, like you said, just looking from 10 years ago to now, it's just totally and completely different. So you guys have definitely had a lot of success with amateur mixed martial artists, but can you tell us a little bit about the success of your professional mixed martial artists moving through the ranks? Oh, I mean, over the years, we've sent tons of people to the UFC. At, at 18 years old and UFC 8, I was cornering Mark Hall, who <laughs> I don't think many people remember him today, but the UFC was illegal around pretty much most of the United States. There was only a few places. I believe we were in we were in Birmingham, Alabama, or Denver, Colorado, one of those states that was legal, one of the early states that it was legal before Dana White and the Fertitas actually owned the organization. It was owned by Art Davey. And um, we, I had a buddy fighting in that, and I was helping him train and helping him work with his ground game and his grappling. And then uh, we, with King of the Cage, maybe six, seven years later, coming about in Southern California, I was teaching for the, the owner of King of the Cage, Terry Triplecock, the promoter, which is one of the first events that started to, to put on fights in the United States after the UFC. And... Uh, he started to grow really big. He started picking up a lot of bigger name fighters and this kind of thing. And uh, training, uh, and uh, because of that competition and competing against a higher level of guys and him constantly putting on events on the Indian reservations where it was legal <coughs> and still is legal, we started, to, uh, we started to produce a lot of talent. And uh, the, we ended up signing a lot of the fighters to the UFC. John Alessio came from our camp, Mac Danzig, Gabe Rudger, Javier Vasquez, and then even today, I mean, the kids we were training yesterday are so much more advanced than we were at the time they are now. And now we have Daryl Montague, who's number five in the world at 125 pounds, and we got, I brought in coaches to help train the fighters. I got about 25 coaches here now, from boxing to wrestling to Muay Thai to Jiu Jitsu. So they're getting really good training. And I think the amateur organizations are, are great because it's not affecting the professional records. And, and these guys could get out there and get a lot of experience. And the gloves are a little bigger. And the rounds aren't as long. And in boxing amateurs, you know, the guys that come out of the amateurs are usually do a lot better than the pros. You know, they get a lot of experience and they get to get out there and fight. That's why I'm a big fan of amateur fights. Thank you so much, Batiste. And don't worry, because we'll be right back with Batiste in a few moments. So I know you mentioned previously in another question that you actually have fought professionally. Mm -hmm. Would you give us a little bit more information about that? Yeah, well, my first fight, I was uh, 19 years old. Yeah, I was either 18 or 19. Um, my opponent was uh, 14 and 0. Um, I didn't really have managers or trainers to kind of uh, overlook me and help me, or an amateur career to 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 build up. I did end up winning the fight on a decision. Um, it was a very tough fight for me. I think had I uh, had I had a few amateur fights or a few professional fights against people that had the same experience with me, I would have probably done a lot better. Um, there wasn't many events going on either. There was like one show going on every year or something, so it's kind of hard to get on. We didn't know who was who. We didn't really know. We didn't really know much about. The, the business side of the sport. Second fight, they flew me to uh, <coughs> they flew me to uh, Michigan. I fought in Michigan, 
and I fought a guy who had a hundred fights and it was my second fight and and again I felt like the promoters just because I was working for the promoter they were kind of throwing me to the wolves they weren't really paying me much money I didn't realize to fight a guy who was who was previously signed with the UFC I would deserve to make some money I didn't really I didn't end up even getting paid for the fight I ended up choking him but I think I was pretty much gassed out and I was hurt and I ended up catching him with a guillotine choke it was Adrian Serrano and I think that was in uh, 2000, 2000 maybe not 2000 then I came back here um, and fought at Saboba Casino again. Again, my opponent was, uh, he was an experienced fighter. He had fought in Pride in Japan. Uh, King of the Cage was developing a relationship with the Pride organization that the UFC ended up building up and taking off. I fought uh, Iji Mitsuyoka, who was a national champion wrestler. We had a draw. Um, we had a draw in that fight. Um, after that fight, I think maybe 2001 I fought, which was, I had my first like fight that it wasn't against somebody who was very high level and more experienced than me. And I beat him pretty quick with a triangle choke. I started to get warmed up to fighting him more comfortable. 2002, I fought Dennis Hallman, who is currently signed with the UFC. He's still fighting and uh, Dennis Hallman, uh, Dennis Hallman beat me. He submitted me with a choke. And I think uh, at that point, I was, I didn't really see the sport growing. I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. My parents didn't really like the fact that I was fighting and in the sport. I had a decent job. I was bartending and I was also in the real estate industry and that was growing. So I just decided to, to uh, pursue that. And I ended up opening a real estate company and I stopped bartending and we had the gym and we had all these fighters and all these kids that were training but I just uh, I didn't think it was going anywhere it was a hobby we had a tiny little gym next door to my office and then we were sending guys to the UFC and these guys weren't making much money so I was pretty much I was pretty much raised to to make a nice career for myself my parents hated fighting my dad said we looked like we were gay when we were wrestling around on the ground so it just uh, at the time, I didn't think it was going to blow up. So it was a part-time thing. Well, thank you so much, Batiste, for everything and really giving us an insight as to Millennia, how it grew, the programs, and everything like that. So we just want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And stay tuned, viewers, because we have a lot of good stuff coming up. <laughs> Hello IEMMA fans and welcome back to another great episode. I'm your host Sam Yurook and lucky for you I am here with Daryl Montague who fights for Millennia Gym in Rancho Cucamonga. Hi Daryl. Hi what's up guys. So I have a couple questions for you. How did you get started with Millennia and why? Why did you want to get started with Millennia? Uh, I started when I was in high school um, you know messing around like any other kid had nothing to do signed up for wrestling and you know the wrestling class or team I met Manny Tapia, who's King of the Cage world champion. He's fought uh, WEC, he's fought world titles, multiple world titles. And he was one of the coaches there, and he just kind of, we started messing around. We would wrestle with each other. We'd start, he'd started teaching me some submissions. And then my, my dad had met Batiste Mansuri. I think my dad was working. Batiste had come in to get some tile. And, you know, I went and tried out his gym, loved it, and I've been training with him ever since. So you started fairly new when the sport was actually pretty new. So can you give us a little inside look at how it was when that was going on? What were some hurdles and things like that you had to accomplish? Uh, nothing really. I mean, I was still young, so I wasn't fighting professionally yet. Um, it wasn't as cool now. Now they have a really, really awesome amateur system where when I was 14 years old, I could have been fighting. You know, people evenly matched up my age. When I was about 15, I started fighting, and any time I would fight, it would be an adult. Uh, I do a lot of try to do a lot of tournaments and stuff like that, uh, and then of, of course when I went to school, no one ever knew what MMA was. No one knew any of that stuff. I'd be talking about fights, and no one knew it. And then once the Ultimate Fighter happened, it was the hottest thing. Everybody was a cage fighter. Everyone knew what was going on, and I was just sitting there quietly, like, "Yeah, I've been doing this for a while. I know what you're talking about." <laughs> 
So it was it was kind of cool uh, being a kid and going and getting to sit in the back of the back of the show with a lot of the guys getting ready for their fights. It gave me a lot of experience. I saw what it looked like, the emotions. I got to see what the mindset of a person going and getting ready to fight. So I think I have an advantage on most people where I wasn't just blindly going into this sport. I've been around it since I was a kid. So I knew what kind of mental preparations and what kind of nerves go on in the back before the fight, which I don't think most people get the, get the chance to even experience that, let alone you know, be right there, part of it. So over 10 years, you've worked with a ton of different promoters and really gotten an experience and a feel for them. Now, you know, there could be great promoters and not so great promoters. Give us a look from that aspect of it. How is it working like that and what are the pressures under that? Uh, I don't think, you know, there's such thing as a good promoter or a bad promoter. They're all promoters. It's a business. They're looking to make money. I'm looking to make money. So what I'm really looking for into a promoter is giving me an even matchup for the amount of money it's worth. I mean. I don't want to go and fight a number two ranked guy in the world for, you know, peanuts and then vice versa. If they're going to pay me the right, they're going to pay me peanuts, I want to fight, you know, someone who's worth peanuts. Uh, all promoters, they try to be pretty fair, you know, fighters, they have their thing and it's a lot of fighters, on the other hand, don't want to fight tough fights. So sometimes it's not always the promoter's fault that the, you know, matchups aren't that great. Uh, I've worked with some promoters that were you know, really up front and wanted to get everything in paper and make sure everything was, all the, dot, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, but the other promoters just kind of do it with the handshake and you never know what you're going to get with them. Sometimes you can go to the fight thinking you're going to get paid one thing and then all of a sudden the fight ends and it ain't what you thought you were going to get. So you can't really get too mad about it. You just got to build yourself up and learn from your mistakes and try to get, get with a promoter who's going to treat you well. Okay, so what goes into your training regimen before a fight or when you're preparing for one? What do you do that you find is most successful? Well, and every day I train at least, you know, two to three hours, get a lot of technique. The difference between a regular day and the days that I'm getting ready for a fight is cardio. I'm going to do a lot more cardio. I'm going to be pushing my cardiovascular up as high as I possibly can and also my diet, you know. I can't just be eating junk food or eating once a day. You have to get the right amount of foods in you to be able to train to the level that you need to. But yet at the same time, you can't take in so much stuff where you're bloating yourself and you can't get down to the weight that you have to fight at. So it's, it's just like a science project. Almost every fight I do it differently, try to figure out what's work. Uh, I'll get back to you guys when I have the perfect formula, but for now, that's all I got. Well, if part of the formula is not eating junk food, you can count me out right now. <laughs> not doing it. Can't make me. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, 10 years is a long time to fight. You have to have had some amazing accomplishments, and we want to know a little bit more about that. Uh, I've won a couple titles. I've won a couple awards. Uh, if you guys are familiar with SureDog, the, the website, in 2009, I, I got an uh, all-violence team. The HDNet, I got a bloodbath a year runner-up. Uh, some of the titles I've won, I had a Gladiator Challenge 125 belt, uh, world title, and then also the Tachi Palace 125 world title. Other than that, to be continued. So what would be advice that you have to give to up-and-coming fighters that are looking to follow in your footsteps? Uh, work your hardest, try to become the best. Uh, if you're not trying to be the best, why are you doing it? Also do it for the love. Don't try to do it for attention and money because those things might come, they might not. So if you want to be happy, you got to be able to you know, do just, just for the love of the sport. and. Of course, competition, try to be the best, so it's the only advice I have. Thank you so much, Daryl. And that's going to wrap it up here with us at IE MMA with Daryl Montague. Okay, um, one common finish you'll see in uh, a lot of fights is a uh, uh, rear naked choke on the ground. Uh, I'm gonna have Jake sit down for me. Uh, right here. What you wanna do when you're buying somebody is you always wanna hook your feet first, okay? 
stick your, uh, you gotta make sure you're sticking your chest to your opponent's back and your chin is gonna be hanging out around the shoulder, okay? Uh, next thing I'm gonna do is put them in what's called the seat belt. Seat belt is one arm over, one arm underneath his armpit. One arm over the shoulder, one arm underneath. Hand that goes underneath goes over the hand that's over his shoulder and I'm gonna hang on to him like this. And uh, in this position, usually when your opponent uh, tries to escape this position, they're gonna pull down on this arm here, which shoots this, gives me the opportunity to shoot this across. And then I pull this out. My hand goes on my bicep. I turn my other hand backwards, slipping it behind his head. My chin comes on top and then I squeeze my elbows together and it chokes them out. Are you ready to try it? As ready as I'll ever be. All right. Have a seat, Jake. So you're gonna sit on your butt. You're gonna get the hooks in there. And now you're gonna put them in the seat belt. With you here and underneath. Get a grip, oh, hug, okay. like a little monkey. There you go. Now, what I want Jake to do is, Jake, I want you to roll, roll around a little bit so you see how important it is to have your legs in. Roll all the way through, all the way through. See how she could stay on his back? Roll, 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 keep rolling around. Ta-da, ta-da, and back. Now, Sammy, I want you to finish the choke. No, he's gonna pull it down there. Okay. So you're gonna have to come here and turn this backwards, slip it behind his head. Uh, put this inside here, nice and tight. Chin down, okay. squeeze your elbows together. Choke. And that's the rear naked choke. So Batiste, tell us a little bit what's going on here. What are you gonna do next? Well, what I'm going to do usually, you'll see MMA fights in this position. I have him in what's called the guard. Most fans are pretty hip to this already. They got a good idea of it. And uh, I'm going to go into a triangle choke as well from this position. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab both of his wrists because I don't want him to hit me, right? If I control his hands, it's going to be hard for him to land punches on me. Now people tend to reach back to throw punches at me. See how he'll kind of reach back like that? I'm gonna put this foot here and I'm gonna cross my feet, okay? Now, I'm gonna go inside control, pull this elbow over. This is my stick shift, okay? okay. You gotta make sure the car's in gear before you drive a stick shift, right? Right, Next, Good thing I'm gonna I go to, to the steering wheel. With this hand, I grab my own shin. Now I put my foot in the clutch. I hit the clutch and I turn the steering wheel as I'm holding the stick in gear. Now I can release the clutch and pull, put it on the gas, interlock, and lift my hips up. That's a triangle choke. Talk about aggressive driving. So one more time. <laughs> He reaches up to punch me. I shoot my leg, right? right. I'm gonna drag his elbow across. What's this? That's your stick shift. Good. Now I'm gonna grab what? Your clutch? Steering wheel. Oh, your steering wheel. You're gonna turn hard. <laughs> and this is the... The clutch. Put it in gear. Lock it, that's the gas, pinch my knees together, interlock my fingers behind his head, lift my hips up. And that's the triangle choke. You Good wanna to try know. it? And now I'm hoping you're gonna walk me through this step by step. I will. All right, let's do it. All right guys, don't worry. I'll go easy on him. We're back with Matisse and Jake and they're gonna show us how to do a triangle choke. Okay, Sammy is on her back. 
in the guard position. Her legs are wrapped around Jake's uh, waist. When you're on your back, if you get put on your back in a fight, this is the position that you actually want to make sure you put the top opponent in. Feet crossed around the waist. Wrist control. She's controlling both wrists. As soon as Jake reaches up to punch her with the right hand, she's going to pull her left leg in and over, crossing her feet immediately. Once the feet are, are, are crossed, that is, that's establishing control. Now she's going to do what's called an arm drag to Jake's left arm, pulling it all the way across, reaching over the tricep, pinching it into her hip bone. She's going to grab her left shin with her hand, right foot goes in the hip, kick, pull that shin hard, and now you're going to finger for your knee over your ankle. So you're going to lock your knee over your ankle, you're going to kick down hard, you're going to interlock your fingers, put them behind your opponent's head, lift your hips up and pull his head down. That's the choke, he's choking right now. Triangle. All right, IEMMA, we'll be back with more awesome moves in just a second. And that wraps it up here for us at IEMMA. We'd like to thank Batiste and Daryl for the amazing interviews and Jake for showing me the finer points of a ground game. Tune in next week. We can't wait to see you guys.